I'm Alex Michelson. This week on The Issue Is, the man who'd become Speaker of the House if the Democrats win control of Congress, Hakeem Jeffries, is here for the very first time. Then an exclusive interview with the senior senator from California, Alex Padilla. The Issue Is starts right now. Broadcasting across California, you're watching The Issue Is. The D in Democrat stands for deliver. That was Democratic leader Hakeem Jeffries at the start of last Congress. Could he start the next Congress as the Speaker of the House? Joining us now here on The Issue Is for the first time is House Minority Leader Hakeem Jeffries. Welcome. Great to be with you. Uh, so uh, there are a lot of commentators that believe that the key to the Democrats winning back the House is California. Do you agree with that? Well, California is going to be an incredibly important state. It always has been particularly under the extraordinary leadership of Speaker Pelosi. But when we look at the numbers, uh, we're four seats short of taking back the House. Now there are 16 seats that Republicans now hold that President Biden won in 2020. Nine of those seats are in New York and California, four in New York, five in California. And so by the numbers, the opportunities are disproportionately weighted between our two states, and that's why California is going to be so incredibly important. Um, are, are there particular districts, one or two districts in California, you're especially focused on? Well, there are two seats that are very important for us in the Central Valley, uh, where we have two strong candidates, Adam Gray and Rudy Salas. Uh, of course, we have to make sure that we hold the seat that is going to be vacated by Katie Porter uh, in Orange County. There's a seat in the Antelope Valley where George Whitesides is a strong candidate uh, who's running against Congressman Garcia. Uh, and then, of course, Will Rollins, who's running in Riverside County. Of course, we have to make sure uh, that we return Mike Levin and Josh Harder to the United States Congress as well. Big story this week on Capitol Hill, uh, TikTok. There was a bill to ban TikTok if uh, they do not divest from the Chinese uh, company, ByteDance, uh, in the next 180 days. It passed overwhelmingly in the House. You supported it. Why do you support it? Well, uh, I don't support a ban on TikTok, of course, but I do support divestiture in terms of ByteDance and their ownership of TikTok uh, because that essentially means that TikTok is functionally owned by the Chinese Communist Party. Not a friend of the United States of America, or the friend of our people, but an adversary to our people. And the ownership of TikTok by ByteDance basically creates a situation where user data and user privacy is greatly at risk. And so a divestiture, which will allow for TikTok to be owned by an American company, I think is in the best interest of everyone. And it will allow TikTok users to continue to benefit from the platform that many of them so enthusiastically embrace. I mean, you say you don't support a ban, but if there isn't divestiture, it is a ban, right? Well, well let's take one step at a time. The bill passed uh, out of the House. We have to see the progress that is made in the Senate. And there will be a lot of people lined up prepared to purchase TikTok as a lit social media <laughs> property. I don't think there are going to be any challenges there. So TikTok says the Chinese government doesn't have any control over the data. They say that's not true. We don't share the information with them. Do you have specific evidence that they do? Well, I'm not at liberty to reveal classified information. And I think the classified presentations did create a lot of concern for Republicans and Democrats who were able to hear that information. Uh, but what we do know is that the Chinese Communist Party, uh, which is not an entity known for respecting privacy or civil liberties of its own people, let alone the American people, does have the ability and visibility, if they so choose, to have access to all of the private data and personal information of the more than 170 million or so TikTok users in America. And that's a problem. That should concern everyone. But are they? Accessing that? Well, you know, that remains to be seen in terms of what is publicly available. But what I think I can clearly say is that they have the opportunity to do it. They can make the determination at any moment in time to do it. And they can also weaponize 
the platform in terms of disinformation, and there's reason to believe that in a variety of different areas, that has already taken place. Maybe not directly ordered by the Chinese Communist Party, but certainly not being done in terms of how the algorithms are managed in a way to promote American values at all times. Another big story of the week is what's happening in Israel. Uh, your colleague from New York, uh, the senior senator from New York, Chuck Schumer, the Senate Majority Leader, highest ranking Jewish American in the history of the government, um, speaking out this week and suggesting that it may be time soon for new elections in Israel. Here's some of that. And I believe that holding a new election, once the war starts to wind down, would give Israelis an opportunity to express their vision for the post-war future. Do you agree with that? Is, is Senator Schumer right? Well, I'm going to personally refrain uh, from commenting on whatever may or may not take place in Israel in terms of the current government or the new government, other than to say that I've got full faith and confidence in the Israeli people to make the right determination about what their future should look like. So you're not ready to go as far as Senator Schumer went? Yeah, my view, and this is just my view, um, I'm going to keep the focus on what needs to happen in the moment. And in my view, that's defeating Hamas, hostages out, humanitarian assistance in. And also, I think we all do need to be prepared. And first of all, I think it should be clear, there is no one who's been more pro-Israel throughout his entire career than Chuck Schumer. Mm -hmm. No one. But my view is that once we can get to the point of the day after, then I think we should be prepared uh, for the reconstruction of Gaza. We should be prepared for partnering with moderate Arab states like Jordan and Egypt, working with Israel and perhaps some of the Gulf states. We should be prepared for what new Palestinian leadership looks like. Uh, and we should figure out how do we get a just and lasting peace in place through a two-state solution. Uh, Speaker Johnson suggested this week that he may do a standalone bill to fund Israel, potentially with Democratic votes. Would you vote for that? Well, my view continues to be that we have a bipartisan, comprehensive national security bill that came over from the Senate with the support of 70 members of that body, Democrats and Republicans, uh, that should receive an up or down vote on the floor of the House. Because we all know if it does, and this is a bill that provides support for Ukraine, for Israel, for our Democratic allies in the Indo-Pacific, and provides humanitarian assistance to civilians in harm's way in theaters of war across the world, if that bill hits the floor, it will pass with at least 300, if not more, votes. That's the clearest path to protecting America's national security interests. And really, in my view, and I say this respectfully, as it relates to the House Republican leadership, that's all that needs to happen. And if that were to occur next week, when we get back to Washington, then we can get this done. But if he says, we're not going to do that, but I will give you a standalone bill on Israel and I'll give you a standalone bill on Ukraine, do you support that? Well, we'd have to look at the parameters of what also was included. What do we do with our allies in the Indo-Pacific? What are we going to do about humanitarian assistance? What they've done before is to leave out humanitarian assistance. And we've made clear now, not once, but twice, that's a non-starter. That's a non-starter. We have a leadership place in the world for a reason, and we cannot abandon it. And this whole issue about not funding Ukraine, which makes no sense because Vladimir Putin is a brutal figure and an enemy of the United States of freedom, democracy, and truth. Ukraine is fighting for freedom, democracy, and truth. And that's where the United States should continue to be. Up next, how Speaker Nancy Pelosi and the notorious B.I.G. shaped Leader Jeffrey's worldview. We're speaking with Hakeem Jeffries, the Democratic leader uh, in the House, and uh, this is your first time on the show. And for some people watching, this may be their first, you know, introduction to you. Um, can you tell us a little bit about you and what made you want to get involved in politics in the first place? I was born in Brooklyn Hospital, raised in Crown Heights, a working class neighborhood uh, in central Brooklyn, grew up in the Cornerstone Baptist Church, kind of came of age in the 80s into the early 90s 
in the midst of the crack cocaine epidemic, tough time, you know, in Brooklyn, in many inner city communities uh, across the country. Thankful for, you know, a nurturing family and a nurturing community. Uh, and after graduating from law school, practicing law for a few years, just decided that I wanted to use my legal training, hopefully, to give back. And ultimately, um, pursued public service, ran for office, initially unsuccessful, ultimately got elected to the state assembly, and sort of the rest is history from there. And it's just an honor to be able to serve the public uh, and now the country for such a time as this. And, and potentially um, replace Nancy Pelosi as speaker. What is the most important thing that she taught you about that job? Well, Nancy Pelosi, I think, taught us to be inclusive but decisive, to make sure to involve everyone because, you know, our diversity is our strength, as she consistently has pointed out, but as she has also said, our unity is our power. So at the end of the day, we've got to make a decision and decide how to move forward and do it together. It's just an honor, you know, to be able to follow in Nancy Pelosi's incredible footsteps. I mean, Nancy Pelosi, I've said repeatedly, is kind of like the Serena Williams of the House of Representatives. She's the greatest of all time. Of course, the immediate replacement to Speaker Pelosi was another speaker from California, Kevin McCarthy. Yeah. Uh, what was he like behind the scenes? Well, you know, I mean, I think we had a, an open, um, communicative, forward-looking relationship. Of course, we didn't agree on most issues, but we did agree to disagree without being disagreeable, and that's the same approach that I've tried to take with Mike Johnson uh, for the good of the country. How is Johnson maybe differ from McCarthy? Well, I think Johnson is clearly a, um, you know, a, a, a committed, you know, right wing, socially conservative Republican. Uh, but, and, you know, he believes what he believes, and we strongly disagree with each other on a whole host of issues. Uh, but he's coming to a difficult situation. And I think we've tried to work together as best we can to fund the government. We've avoided a government shutdown now on multiple occasions. We've passed the first six of 12 spending bills. We're working on the final six which hopefully uh, at some point upon our return to Washington next week, we'll get that done. And then we'll see what other opportunities exist to advance the ball for the American people. You feel good that the, the government will be funded next week? Uh, I'm pretty confident that we will avoid a government shutdown. We'll fund the government and we'll do it in a manner consistent with our values. When we come back, Leader Jeffries plays personal issues. Talk a little bit more about you. you. You posted a really beautiful and loving tribute to your father last year on yeah. Instagram. Um, and as we get to know you, can you talk to us about the most important lessons he taught you? Well, you know, I think loyalty, love for family, uh, and a quiet dignity and strength uh, were some of the things that I think dad tried to pass down to my younger brother and myself. Uh, he was a, a substance abuse social worker spent a lot of time in the community during some difficult, challenging moments, you know, back at home and the, the heroin explosion of the 70s, the crack cocaine epidemic uh, in the 80s and 90s, he saw a lot, uh, and he really cared for others. And, you know, my mom, who also, you know, was, was a caseworker, you know, working for the health and human services um, entities back at home uh, as well, that, that, that community for them was always important, and I think, that was something that was passed down uh, to my younger brother and myself. Um, somebody else you're a big fan of is Notorious B.I.G. And you got a lot of attention when you went on the House floor and said this. It was all a dream. I used to read Word Up magazine. How does the Notorious B.I.G., who is, of course, a proud son of Brooklyn yeah. <laughs> from your district, um, shape your worldview? Uh, grew up a few blocks from where I live uh, right now. I'm proud to represent uh, the neighborhood where he is from, proud to know his mom. And, you know, I think one of my favorite songs that he's written is something called Sky's the Limit. And it talks about the journey of where he came from, incredibly humble beginnings, uh, and where he was able to end up, you know, as an international hip hop artist, the work ethic, the heart, the soul that it takes. And also, I think it in his own way is reflective of what the American dream 
represents, which is opportunity. Work hard, and you can go places that in other parts of the world you would never imagine you can get to or could not get to. Yeah. If you know, you know. If you don't know, now you know. <laughs> After that. Um, so we've got, uh, we do a game to wrap things up called Personal Issues. This is yeah. 30 seconds, cultural favorites, first thing that comes to mind to get to know you a little bit better. All right, we ready? Here we go. What's your favorite TV show? Game of Thrones. Favorite movie? L.A. Confidential. Favorite sports team? Knicks. Favorite athlete? Reggie Jackson. Favorite way to relax? Uh, go to the movies with family. Um, what is your favorite rap lyric of all time? Um, uh, I would say, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a lyric um, from the Wu-Tang Clan, uh, which has always stuck with me. We've got stick-up kids, corrupt cops, and crack rocks, and stray shots, all on the block that stays hot. But leave it up to me, and I'll be living truth to kick the truth to the young black youth. Shorty's wondering why I'm smoking sass, drinking beer, and ain't trying to hear what I'm kicking in his ear. <laughs> Neglected for now, but yo, it's got to be accepted that what? That life is hectic. Mm. And I always thought that that was just such a powerful encapsulation of like tough inner city life and also the hope that, you know, you can pass along the roughness of the journey to someone young, Wu-Tang Clan. Very nice. Wow. It's got a whole performance there. That was excellent. Thank you so much for coming on. It's really great to talk with you. Hopefully we'll get to talk to you more in the uh, competitive year ahead for California. Up next, our conversation with Senator Alex Padilla. We always, always end our segments with music, so we only thought it would be appropriate to end with this. Take it away, Biggie. Was all a dream. I used to read Word Up magazine. Something pepper and heavy D up in the limousine. Are you going to be endorsing in the race? Up until now, I have not uh, because uh, the California is going to elect a Democrat. Uh, in, the in October, Senator Alex Padilla appeared on the issue is and wasn't quite ready to endorse in California's U.S. Senate race. Well, now he is. Joining us now from Washington for an exclusive interview is California senior Senator Alex Padilla. Welcome back to the issue is. Thank you, Alex. I know it's uh, from afar. We'll be back in studio next time, but uh, good to be with you tonight. All right, so in what is going to be a shock to no one, <laughs> it is now down to <laughs> Republican Steve Garvey versus Democrat Adam Schiff. Who are you endorsing? Look, as big of a Dodger fan as I am, I'm endorsing and will be voting for Adam Schiff uh, this November to uh, be my uh, calling in the United States Senate. Uh, uh, it was... Uh, competitive race in the primary, but uh, the voters spoke loudly uh, and clearly with uh, Schiff and Garvey in the solid, uh, being the solid top two vocators here. Uh, the contrast couldn't be clearer. Uh, in Adam Schiff, you have someone who uh, uh, has uh, many years of public service under his belt, uh, not just uh, the champion that a lot of people got to know as a defender of democracy against attacks on democracy by former President Trump, but someone who for years before that has been a champion for labor rights uh, and so much more. So uh, uh, I'm excited uh, for November uh, and to welcome him uh, next next Congress. And I also heard that, that you actually welcomed him into the Democratic caucus this week uh, and are already starting the process of sort of training him for the job. Can you talk to us about that? Look, uh, there's no time to lose. You know, we take the process seriously. There is still November, uh, but I'd be shocked and stunned if something went sideways and he was not victorious. So in the interest of being as prepared as possible to hit the ground as quickly as possible in the Senate, uh, I thought it'd be worthwhile for him to join a uh, meeting of uh, Senate Democrats this last week, begin to know his future colleagues. You know, it's a, a Democrat versus a Republican this November in California, so we can afford to ask uh, uh, Congressman Schiff to help maybe raise funds or campaign for some of our uh, incumbents in uh, states that uh, are gonna be a much more battleground state. I wanna ask you about one of the big stories of the week. The House passed a bill that requires that TikTok be sold to a non-Chinese company or risk being banned in the U.S. It now heads to the Senate. Would you vote for that? 
The, uh, well, I, we're certainly taking the issue very seriously because uh, based on initial briefings, there are very real national security concerns uh, with the platform and more specifically, the, the dangers of our data and private information uh, being in the possession and subject to abuse by the Chinese Communist Party. Do, do you uh, yeah. agree with this concept that TikTok should be sold, and if it's not sold, that it should be banned? Uh, I, I do agree with the premise of the bill, uh, but again, the way the language is written, there's a lot of, uh, I think, misimpressions out there that Congress is trying to shut down TikTok, you know, if the owners of TikTok are willing to do what they should do uh, and disassociate themselves with the Chinese government. Uh, it's probably going to be better for their business, but I know it'll be better for users of the platform. Let's end with something fun. We've talked a lot about baseball over the years and your Dodger fandom. But now you have a new favorite team, the Angels. Your son Alejandro is playing for the Angels in Little League. How's he doing and what kind of fan are you? Uh, well, I uh, was, uh, did acquire an Angels hat to be able to root for him uh, in the stands uh, during his games. As you know, I'm a diehard Los Angeles Dodger fan. So my manager league loyalty is absolutely intact, but uh, our kids come first. And uh, if he's on the Angels, if, as he's been on other teams, uh, whoever he plays for, that's who I'm rooting for. Are you like the loud, obnoxious dad or what are, <laughs> what are you like at the ball game? Look, uh, in full honesty, and this isn't bragging, this is being real, uh, I love the opportunities on the weekend when I get to uh, help out with practices, even uh, uh, pitching batting practice with the kids. Uh, it's as uh, grounding uh, as uh, you can imagine. Well, good luck to him and good luck to you out on the field. And so, you know, we like to end with music. So in the spirit of Alejandro, we go to break with John Fogarty's center field. Senator Padilla, thanks for being with us. Thank you, Alex.